Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I would suggest with all Triumphs, they come out of the factory. I'm not, I'm not talking about the new breed of Triumphs, the new 1200 Bonnevilles and so on. I'm talking about the early ones, the 865 engines. So if you've got an 865 Triumph, I would say they come out of the factory running too lean. You could take your totally stock, bone stock, unmodified Triumph back to the dealer and say, put the arrow map on it, please. And the arrow map, which they keep, which takes oh, two minutes to download into your ECU, done. They charge you pennies for it, usually half an hour on it, it's like 30 quid. Once that's done, it will run better anyway, without any mods at all. Then you can go put the pipe on it, because it, the easiest way to explain it is that the, the fuel map on any bike is, is, is a certain bandwidth of adjustment from really, really lean to a little bit richer. And that gives you atmospheric adjustment for a hot day or a cold day. And the bandwidth is quite narrow on the factory map. On the arrow map, it's simply a lot wider. So you give yourself far more adjustability for weather, and also you can start to do other things like adjustability for pipes. So we put your two into one tech short stumpy pipe on this mm -hmm. with the K&M filter and the arrow map, and it's absolutely brilliant. But when I put the baffle in the pipe, it can run on the factory map. So really don't get too hit up about it. You can ride these bikes on the factory map, but they run too lean from the factory anyway. So it never hurts to remap them, richen them up, cool them down when they're running, a little bit more fuel, a bit less air, makes that mixture a bit safer, especially if you live in a hot climate, very important. And always, if you've got a factory map, run your engine on the best quality fuel you can, and that will prevent it. But the Harley one, sports one, one's really important because so many times we get contacted and people yeah. saying that the Harley dealer has told them it's going to cost them, they have to have it done, and it's 1250 pounds. Yeah, there is a certain <laughs> inference, isn't there? You'll talk to the guy in the parts department at your Harley dealership, and they will certainly infer that if you're going to have the pipes and you have an air filter, you must have it remapped or else your warranty, blah, 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 blah. Honestly, <clears throat> if, they, if they simply don't know, then you can forgive them that. But if they do know and they're genuinely saying this to get you to spend money, I think mean, that's appalling. It truly is. But the fact of the matter is you can run a Sportster on open free-flowing mufflers, just the silence apart, and an open filter on the factory map. It's absolutely fine. We run it. Our buddy Carlos does that. Mm -hmm. He's, I've got, you know, Carlos and the transitions. He's got 48. That has got a, a little tiny rough crafts air filter, open like Bassani pipes, I think. And he runs it on the standard factory map. And yeah. he has done for ages and ages. And I checked one of the spark plugs when we did a service recently. And they're absolutely fine. That bike is running beautifully. I did with my iron. You did with your iron as yeah. well. Yeah, you don't need to. Not a sports star. But if it's a big twin, that's not the case. You must remap for a big twin because they run too lean. Turn the heat down a bit. Noisy. Okay. <laughs> right, next question. Um, Joe better. Jones says, Jones. what is your motivation to keep going with YouTube after five years? You seem to do more videos than anyone else I watch. <laughs> Man, you do, you do. Well, we settled into a rhythm, didn't we, about six months mm -hmm. ago of two videos a week, Wednesday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. In the last two months, we've been doing Saturday and Sunday with the prize draws. So we're going to probably try and keep doing the prize draws if we can, because it's just a great thing, isn't it? Yes, yeah, It fun. really is. It does. It, yeah. It interacts us with you better. So, I don't know, when are we going to start? I don't know, really. Well, it's not know. just that, is it? I think when people invest their time in watching yeah. a video, and I see so many channels, not just bike related, no. um, well, they'll, they'll go at it, and then it peters off, and well, then it'll okay. be a video every three weeks, and then it might yeah. be another month, and then yeah. it might be six weeks, and, and you kind of invest in that time, and you think, oh. It's gone, yeah, when you see a channel disappear, well, we've always felt that it's important to deliver what we've set up to deliver, so you know that we run a schedule, Wednesday's important, if sometimes we have to film Wednesday's video on a Sunday mm -hmm. because I might be working Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. I've got no time to film it. So we film mm -hmm. it on the Sunday, get it ready and we upload it. So it's just about logistics mm -hmm. really and organisation. If you do it, mm -hmm. it's not difficult. As for slowing down, I don't think so. I mean, the project has got to get done. I can't just, I can't just take five years over this. I want this bike on the road this next coming season before the sunshine goes. I want it on the road, I want it going to some shows. I want it to be nice to take a bright tone, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, I want it on the road. So I don't want this going forever. So we have even if we weren't filming it, I'm just going to be in the garage as often, if not more so, doing more stuff. So, I don't know, there's no need to slow it down. We enjoy it, don't we? Mm -hmm. This is the point. We really enjoy it. Perhaps we'll slow it down when we don't enjoy it so much. I don't know. And I see that coming. I love it. There you Right, there you go. Cool. Hope that answers it. Uh, Adrian Pilwinton says, <clears throat> do winter tyres exist for bikes? And if they do, are they worth it? Adrian Pilwinton. Hello, Adrian. Mm. I don't know, actually. I don't think they do. I've never seen them. I mean, there are things like the TKC80s, 
but I wouldn't call them a winter tyre by any means. I think they're a 50-50 road enduro type tyre. Uh, there are chunky rugged tyres, and yes, you can get them in sizes that fit your superbike. So you could go and buy, if you lived in Canada and you want to ride through snowy winter weather, you could buy a, a pair of TKC80s and you could perhaps get some spare wheels and just swap them like you do with your car for, for the season. I don't know, but I don't really think they exist. I don't know. I don't know enough about tyres to know that snow snow tyres exist. I know that you can get them for cars, we know that, don't we? But I don't know. You've, uh, you've only ever ridden on your normal tyres, but just make yeah. sure that they're in good condition yeah. and inflated properly. That's the point, yeah. yeah. It's far more important. That's, that's a good point, yeah. It's good. It's far more important to, to make sure that your tyres are are not old and hardened off and tired. I mean, these tires on the, on the project, they've got masses of tread, but they're rock hard, they're up years old, and they're definitely going in the bin long before that goes on the road. So tires that are healthy and recent and in good condition and properly inflated are far more important than worrying about the tread. Um, and if it's that bad, don't ride, you know, take yourself, be careful. You so, have to so make a decision, don't you? Make a choice. There's no, dis there's no dishonor in crying off and staying at home or taking the car because we need you all here tomorrow <laughs> mm, <that's laughs> you know, right. live to fight another day and all that yeah. yes. these people who go on about oh you're wimpy and lame because you don't ride in winter yeah well i'll come and pick the pieces <coughs> up when you fall in a hedge you know it's there's no that all that regard that braggart is, is is crap i don't believe in it um you know winter time comes make a decision then you're where you live actually this one this question leads into it a bit it? uh john Harold lolland uh what do you do to be visible in the dark winter months sort of leans on, leans on to the winter riding. Well, if you're asking, in case you're trying to find, I don't wear high vis, I'm afraid. I've never worn high vis. I don't like high vis. I don't think it does anything for you. Um, I've known of police officers I've had conversations with on their motorcycle is covered in Battenberg yellow and blue. They're covered head to foot in chartreuse, day glow like a lollipop lady with reflective, with blue flashing lights, and they still get pulled out on by blind people who are not looking. People can't see what they're lo looking at. It doesn't matter how bright or shiny it is or how many lights are on it. If they ain't looking in that direction, they ain't gonna see it. I think what I do to be seen, not just in the winter, but at all times, is I place myself on the road in a conspicuous position. And if I think that perhaps I can't be seen, I'll hesitate, I'll drop back, and I'll put myself in a position I can be seen, and if necessary, I'll stop, and wait for the situation to pass, and then I'll carry on. I think being in the right place is far more relevant than looking colorful. <laughs> There's loads of techniques in there. The uh, advanced jollies will tell you there's this thing of shimmying. If you're coming up the road and the car's coming out of a junction, if you move side to side, it moves you against your background. If you're coming up the road stationary, you're stationary. Effectively, although you're coming towards them, mm. against your background, you're stationary. If you start moving side to side, you're more visible. But that can also send the wrong signal. That if you're moving side to side, you're gonna go off that way or that way and they're just gonna pull out. But again, if they're looking the other way, you could be jumping up and down away from your arms and flags. It doesn't matter, they can't see you if they ain't looking. So being conspicuous is about visibly being within someone's eye shot so they can see you. Uh, and vigilance, isn't it? What do you, what do you say? What's your view on that one? Because yeah. you ride in winter too, don't you, sometimes? Sometimes, in the dark as well. you just got to be confident. I just think that, you, you know, the accidents happen and they will happen. Yeah. You just got to ride in a confident manner. That's all. I yeah. Think you just got Old. to be confident. Don't hog the side of the road. Yeah. You know, when you see a junction, yeah. try and pull out a little bit and watch their wheels. Yeah. Because if then you've got a chance either to go behind them. Yeah. Or in front of them. Yeah. You know, it all happens in a moment. It does. So you think just for got them. To try and be safe. Yeah. As arrogant as it sounds, think for them, because if if you're thinking what they might be thinking, then you can perhaps preempt what they might do next. Mm. You know, look through their car and look at their head. Where is it? Mm. Is it down at their phone? Yeah, or is, doing it this, the is it doing this? Yeah, or is it over the back seat punching the kids or something because they're angry and they're not looking where they're going? It depends. Mm. There's so many different things. Mm. Riding a motorcycle is a dangerous business. There's no single answer to that. But as far as I'm concerned, it will never be riding with high vis clothing because I simply don't believe it does anything for you. I think it gives and you I a respect, we sense. respect the view of all of those who mm -hmm. do think it's good and we're not arguing with you. We're just saying that for us, we don't believe that driving along looking like a lollipop lady does anything. In fact, it can give you a false sense of security. If you do that, if you ride wearing full on high vis, that's great, but don't think that it is body armor because it is not. No. It won't protect you any more than if you're wearing all black. In fact, you want to ride around thinking that you're all wearing black and then you'll behave in a way 
that thinks for them. I think personally it's that false sense of security you need to avoid. Uh, but by all means, you wear what you want, what you think works for you. Uh, so other options are available. That's it. Moving okay. on. Moving right along. Right. Uh, next question. John Malley. That's Chicken George. Chicken George? No, it's Sumatra George. Yeah, that's it. That's why he doesn't like Chicken George. Oh. He got quite angry. Oh. <laughs> he when did I see Alfred, him? Our friend John Malley, he was a chicken farmer at one point because he used to farm chickens. Um, uh, Sumatra chickens, so his online name is Sumatra Johnny, which is pretty cool, but we were taking the mickey in the year saying he's such a chicken So he won't George. buy me a cup of he tea? He won't buy us a cup of tea, no, you just blew it now, that's, oh, that's, that's it, buddy. Um, right, anyway, he says, uh, some of the music in your videos is great, do the tunes reflect your taste, or is it whatever you can attach without penalty? Um, well, thanks for that, I, I like the music too. I, I think we, it's a combination, isn't it, really? We need to use music that isn't royalty, royalty royalty enhanced yeah and there are some we make mistakes with some of the covers we use from um uh, from from the transitions um certainly we found a little while ago didn't we that the uh, the six string outlaws we use some of their music which is really cool i absolutely love that mm -hmm. you know m badass country music but it's copywritten so we get copyright strike on it not a detrimental copyright strike what you get is youtube have changed they've mellowed in their old age if you get a cover of something like um, Paint It Black by The Stones. Um, I know that the, the transitions do that, but if I put that on one of our videos, what we get is a copyright share. So you get a little strike on it, you get a little message comes up and says that you share the copyright on this. So some of the copyright goes to EMI or whoever it is, and you get some as well. So I kind of like that, you're sharing it out. We don't mind those. We have to be very careful because you can actually get a full on detrimental strike, like mm. a warning, and this channel is precious to us, we're not going to risk it. But I would also say we do not load any music we do not like. Well, there's really. a lot of free to use music out there, and it's Muzak, and we would never yeah. use that. Well, it's not, I mean, some we... of that stuff, like Purple Planet does some pretty cool stuff, they're really good, and I think the people who do it are good. We've been using the uh, Chill Hop music. Yeah. Which I love that. The chill hop music is great. You've heard a bit of that sort of, sort of hip hop stuff. Because, I, I, as you know, again, not ashamed to admit, I love hip hop music as well, and it's, it goes back to you know youth and so on. But honestly, I think we wouldn't use a track that we don't like. But when we edit but we like, and we do try and use music that kind of reflects what you're doing. Yeah, bit. yeah, we try and make it apt for the for, for, the, for what's on the game. <laughs> we do try. And the other side of it is we get sent a lot of music by artists um, like Bellicose and uh, various other bands. They send us their music. They say please use it. They want us to, and that's called Springy as well. Yeah. Everyone loves Springy and the Blokes. Who doesn't love Springy and the Blokes? Hands down, we love it, don't we? Fantastic. So okay. what else? Right. Please, John. That's it. Come on, because we got loads okay. of questions. Next. Just Tech says, my question is, if there is one DIY project you would want every biker to attend, what would it be? Oh, that's cool. Another question. Mm -hmm. One project we want you all to attempt, what would it be? I think a basic service. It? It's one of the easiest. Oops. I'll get the equipment. Can Repair you? your chair. Repair your chair, yeah. No, I think doing a basic service on your bike. So a basic 5,000 mile service, oil change. Uh, plugs, full safety check. I mean, there's the most basic one is the walk around safety check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's put it that one. I'd say that one. Even if you are a 16 year old first rider, never ridden before, just on your CBT, the one thing that we want you all to learn to do is that walk around check on your bike every time you take it out in the morning. So it's the lights, it's the it's horn, it's brakes, it's steering, it's making sure everything's working, making sure you check your bike over tire pressures. You know, all of the proper stuff, good visual look around the tires, make sure there's no screws hanging out of them, all that stuff. Once you get into that habit, then you start to get to know your bike. Even, do you know what, when we used to do it, when we were in the bike shop, when I ran a motorcycle shop, we used to make the apprentices, the young lads would come in, we'd make them clean the bikes. And cleaning, I mean, don't do thinking that cleaning a bike is not a project. It is a project, because when you clean your bike, you're putting your hands all over every bit of it and you're getting an intimate knowledge of it and you start to build up a history in your head of each little component. And when you see a chip or a scratch or something that wasn't there the last time you did it, then you can deal with it. So there's getting to know your bike, doing basic maintenance, that's it. As far as an actual project mm -hmm. is get yourself some accessories. Fit a few accessories. Yeah, you could fit a few. Get yeah. Get some tools and just fit an accessory. Yeah. I mean, so in, a, in an overall answer to that, that single... That your confidence. That's, that's the point. The overall answer, which isn't actually focused on one project, is grow some confidence in yourself. Uh, the, the great Jesse James made a statement, an awesome statement, and I'm going to get it made into a plaque for the wall because I love it so much. It says, it goes along the lines of, I do not need anybody's help to do this. 
because I have confidence in myself. That's a great statement, and Jesse's like that, isn't he? And I totally agree with that. You should say that to yourself. I do not need anybody's help to do this, or I do not need anyone to do it for me, because I have confidence in myself, and I can do it. If you can do that, that once you climb that hill, you can do anything. On the other side of that hill lies a world of things you can do for yourself, and that confidence, it grows, mm. doesn't it? And it, it's not just bike-related. That can, that can go into different things, can't it? Well, even down to getting a job. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into a job, you believe me, if you fail your own bike, there's far more to riding a bike than just, hang on, let me put that right, there's far more to owning a bike than just riding it. It really is. There's taking care of it in every way, looking after its needs. If you buy a pet, a dog, you don't just walk it and that's all. You look after its every single need. It becomes a part of your life and it shouldn't be that different with your motorcycle. That motorcycle carries you up the road and it's got to be safe at every speed it's capable of doing. If it's a 100 mile an hour bike, it's got to be completely safe at 100 miles an hour. So why wouldn't you make sure that everything about that bike is in a safe condition before you ride it? Once you start to grow that confidence in your bike, you will get, don't you agree, you'll get a confidence in yourself. You get a mm. self-respect, you get a pride a in yourself. Attitude. A can-do attitude. I like you, you're good, I'll keep you on. That's the point. You that get, was a bit it was it? Yeah, yeah, real. Watch it, bro. <laughs> That's the point. Grow that confidence in yourself. Tell yourself, I can do it. And you can. It's as simple as that. Ask someone. Ask us. Ask. There's a million people on the internet that will ask you questions. Ask your mates. Ask the local shop. Ask us. But say hi first. But say hi first. I'll answer that in a minute. But that's the point. I think getting, just getting the confidence to do something for yourself, whatever it might be, and take your time doing it and do a good job, and you'll feel so good about yourself that that will carry through into your whole life. Mm -hmm. A self respect and a self dignity that you don't get by handing it over to the dealer and having a coffee. No. You agree? Agreed? Uh, yeah. Right, what's the next one? Leads us on a little bit, uh, talking about projects. Patrick O'Hagan says, with your project, he yeah. loves it. How, would you, how did you know the integrity of the engine would be worth all the hard work on the body? Oh, Ryan, what's going on? Um, okay. Well, I wrote it home from where we got it from. We got it from Conquest Motorcycles in Three Cross in Hampshire. And that ride home through years of experience told me it's a good engine. It's smooth right across the rev range. There's no hesitation. It pulls like a steam train. It's a lovely engine. Very, very smooth and silky. Uh, also, when I got it home, I did a compression test on it with a compression tester, and I just checked that each of the cylinders is in order. So I did a little check on that. I made sure it's fine first. But obviously, the other side of it is it's a ZX7R. It's a Japanese sports bike from 20 odd years ago. You know, the engines for that are on eBay for 200 quid. So even if that engine didn't have the integrity, I can get another one for next to nothing. That's the point with with playing with Jap sports bikes. So many of them exist that the engines are, are chucked out on the bench. I mean, we're going to be selling, possibly selling the VFR 750 engine at some point. And it's a great engine. It starts, it runs, it's fine. There's nothing you can't do to fix these things. And even if there was something wrong with that engine, it's another video. <laughs> we'll fix it. Ain't problem. Can't be, there's nothing in this world that can't be fixed. Cool. Cool. Uh, Jay Ritchie cool. says, he said it's hardly a year now. I found myself looking for the next one. I've been looking at the options from the MoCo. Motor company. Motor company. The motor. Yeah, but they are not the only show in town. I really like uh, what I'm seeing from Victory. But as far as the mechanicals are concerned, have you looked into Victory yourself and what are your thoughts on how they're put together? Right. The exact answer to the question, what do I think on how Victories are put together? They're fantastic. They're fine. You know, I've, I've never seen um, anything about them that makes me think they're anything less than a Holly or a Jack bike or anything else. You know, any motorcycle you choose to buy. These days, even some of the Chinese stuff is now coming out of the factories in the highest quality of engineering, and there's no need to knock it, so it's great. I think the way, there was a video that's online it's quite, that compares the, the cam drive train of the Harley against the Victory, and that's, I like the way the Victory is so much more simple, but I don't think that that fact that the Harley cam drive train is quite complicated and old school. I don't think that makes in any way there's any integrity there or there's any issue or less quality. I think it's just a different system that makes a little bit more noise. Um, for me personally, I, I like the, the highball, was it? The okay. Victory highball, which is gone now. I don't think that model's in the range anymore. It's the kind of, it was the black and white kind of apang and bobber thing. The riding position on that was awesome. It was perfect. I sat on one at the Bulldog Bash two years ago at their stand and I loved it to death. It's just a perfect badass riding position, but I just can't get over it. It's, it's, it's to me, I'm unfortunately, I suffer from Harleyism. I love my Harley and I don't want anything that's not a Harley. I, I don't, 
I couldn't love it. In the it is out. how it makes you feel. You've got Please. to sit on it and Please. does it sing to you? Well, I'm unfortunately, I'll admit, I'm a, I'm a tart to the, to the product. I'm a tart to the brand. I love the Harley brand. I love the history behind it all and so on and so forth. But I will say, without any hesitation, a Victory motorcycle is a superb piece of engineering. They ride fantastically. I have ridden one. They're amazing. And I think if there was no other choice, I'd be very happy to own a Victory. And I'd enjoy it a lot, especially a highball, because I think they're an awesome bike. But personally, for me, for me personally, it's got to be a Harley. Um, if there is, if, if you don't have that, if that <laughs> affliction, <laughs> and it is an affliction, you know, personally, it is an irrational affliction as well. I love Harleys, and I, I only want a Harley. There's, there's the big Kawasaki Cruiser, the two litre one, fantastic bike. Mm. There's the Rocket 3, oh my God, who doesn't want one of them? We went up to Triumph, didn't we? We rode the uh, Thunderbird. Thunderbird. I rode the Thunderbird, the big 1700, awesome bike. What an incredible machine. You know, neck snap and acceleration, incredible handling, smooth as silk, fabulous. But it left me cold. And that's not because he's not Harley, it's just it, it's, I, it, the lines don't flow, I stand back and look at it, there's no, there's no shape to it that looks right. There's so many things I'd change about it. The pipes look like you could climb up them. You know, it's just, to me, there's so many things not right. But as far as the ride and the engineering, faultless. And the same goes for Victory. Uh, just for me, it's, it's, you know, my, I'm afraid it's got to be a Harley for me and there's no difference with that. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. Good. It's just that it makes you feel. Your motorcycle has got to make you feel good. Feel something. You've got to be proud to own it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, you've got some soul in, so, in it. I don't know if we've helped there, really. I don't know if that's been a help at all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. Just being honest. We're going to move on to Moving right along. You've got quite a lot of lovely questions. Peter Lubeck says, uh, what do you think of the quality of Avon tyres compared to Metza? Um, but that's only if you've had the opportunity to compare them. Oh yeah, over the years, definitely. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I, I would defer to Sean on this, you know Sean? Mm -hmm. We've got a chap that we know very well, he's been a friend of ours for many years, he runs a motorcycle MOT station, he does all the MOTs for us. Um, and he's, he's a very busy guy, very popular, local mechanic, he does cars as well. He's not a dealership, doesn't sell bikes, and I like his attitude to it is that he just took the view that he's never ridden on a Metzler tyre that gave him confidence. And this, he's a tyre guy. He is a tyre guy. He fits tyres for a living. He's got more experience at it than I'll ever have in my whole life. And I have to agree with him. I've ridden on many pairs or sets of Metzlers and I find often they go off quite quick. They'll get halfway through their life and they start to get twitchy. Not impressed. However, that's not to say that their latest brand of tyres aren't brilliant. But what we have found is the Avons, haven't we? Um, yeah. You got the Avon Road Riders on your on bike. We've got. Had them on my last No, these are Continental, Continental. Motions. So we've got Continental Motion Twos on the Triumph at the moment. They're a sports bike tire, mm -hmm. Continental Motions. And on the Harley at the moment, I've got Avon Cobras. Mm -hmm. Now the Avon Cobra is an awesome tire, really mm -hmm. amazing. And I think because a tire is a consumable part, there has to be something in there with the price. And that pair of Cobras on the fat boy cost two hundred and forty pounds. Fitted. 240 mm -hmm. pounds fitted and they're great i mean they're better than the dunlop junk that was on it i mean those there's the one thing i would say the dunlop original dunlop harley davidson tires are absolutely horrible they really are no feel no feedback they go off quick they get rock hard in no Skip time in water yeah as well. yeah well carlos has got dunlops on, the, on, on his mm -hmm. 48 Let's at the get. moment and they're a bit warm but they're lethal he's terrified half the time of riding yeah. it. he won't ride it in the wet yeah. at the moment because he's so bright and there's tyres and I think you know as soon as he can get afford to get them changed he's going to. Um, but personally Avon over Metsy I don't really know I would say love Avon tyres never had a single fault or a single problem with an Avon all the different brands across and Continental as well and Continental are going for it they've got the TKC 80s which I think are a, a, an absolute industry they're not a market they're an industry leader aren't they there's nothing that compares to the, to the TKC 80 tyre so Continental have really stamped their mark on the market uh, as for Metzler, I'm not sure really. I think the sports bike guys. We, would, we can't really give. But I think the sports bike guys would have something different to say oh, because really? I'm not a sports bike guy. And what we end up putting on this, we don't know yet. Depends yeah, on the size of the rims it ends up with. Yeah. Cool. Right. I think that hopefully that yeah. answers it. Yeah. Oh right. Next question. Bognet. Oh. Hi Martin. Right. Have you ever had a bike you didn't like, and what didn't you, what didn't you like about it? No, I haven't really. What about you? I must yeah, admit, right. I had a Japanese cruiser some years ago, and I must have. Oh, yeah. The thing that I didn't like about it was that it it, it didn't steer around corners very, with any definition. That's the thing yeah, I didn't no like. Trail. About it. Yeah, it was a boulevard, which is the mm. Americans call it a boulevard, 
In this country, it's the intruder, isn't it? Mm, Suzuki, like the Boulevard, the American one. Yeah, the American one. Yeah. So it's, to us, it's the Suzuki 800 intruder, isn't it? Mm. And the problem with them is they have uh, an odd fork rake, don't they? And they have no trail, virtually no, you know, rake and trail on you. They had almost uh, that two degrees mm. of trail. It was really rubbish, and it flopped into corners, didn't it? It didn't want to track straight on its own. It let the steering go, and it just went off. It was like riding a chopper with long forks, wasn't it? That was a bit weird. That they really thought weird. it out, but. I know a lot of people who like their intruders, they're quite popular bike. Um, but for me, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't um, think I've ever owned you a like bike. bikes? I did, have a, I did a CZ once. <laughs> I had a CZ250 once, I paid 40 quid for it from a mate at work. We had loads of fun with some combat green paint and an old Mustang tank. But again, I quite actually like that. It was quite fun, I wouldn't want it back though, piece of shit. <laughs> okay. No, I don't know. Not really, never had anything I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a bike I didn't like. I think we kind of covered this one a little bit in the first video. Simon Titterton says, um, what are you doing with that bloody VFR? Oh God, yeah. What, what? are we doing with that bloody VFR? Um, let's show you the one we made. <laughs> yeah, it's just an ornament a minute, if you can't see it. It's that one there. Now that's going to be, um, hang on, let's get that back again. Yeah, that's, that's going to be next, next year's project. I think we covered it earlier, didn't we? I may rob the, the uh, single side swing arm at the back of it for the project. If I do, then it will probably be broken up and sold off. I don't know. If not, then it might be a project. I don't know. Don't know. But it was very kindly donated by our friend George Milburn at Tech Bike Parts. George is a very good friend. Um, we've known George for many years. We've done many of his parts and videos supporting him. So George just literally gave it to us. It was a project he started years ago. I think he let an apprentice do some work on it and just bits and pieces and he just intended to do something quite trick with it but never went anywhere, bit of a blind alley for him so he said you want it and there it is. It runs, uh, it's got a logbook now, we did an HPI check on it, it's got a clear title, it's got you know a clear logbook so it could be a perfectly good bike um, but there are no plans at the moment are there? No, Other than to you've got enough to do. I've got enough on the plate really, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, cool. someone called James here says I've got a Phaser 600 Cool. Uh, the bike is everything I could ever want in two wheels, but I'm young cool. and I could do with putting the money towards a place to live. Should I sacrifice my bike to satisfy my life progress? Well, cool question. I think if you're really? young and you've got a chance to buy your own place, you should sacrifice your bike. Definitely. Because in 10, 15, 20 years time, you'll regret that. If you're just going to do it to take the money to rent, I'd say no, don't do it. Carry yeah. on saving up and keep your bike. But if you're going to do yeah. it to get yourself on the property ladder, because God knows what the prices are going to be I in agree. 20 years' time, yeah, I totally sacrifice it. Agree, totally agree. In I think those of you who followed the channel know that when that recession came, the, the last one, um, I went from from one bike up the stack to a brand new fat boy, fourteen thousand pound bike at one point. Uh, then I sold that, traded down to an XR12, then I had to sell that, trade down to an Iron, mm -hmm. uh, and then I sat out, I traded down to the Bandit, which I then turned into a rat bike. So I have always sacrificed my bike when I've needed money for life, uh, mm -hmm. because there is always another bike, isn't there? Even if you go and spend, I mean, you love your bike, I get that, mm -hmm. believe me, I get that. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, if you can embrace the world of the rat bike, <laughs> which is a... <laughs> fabulously fun world to play in you know the whole rat bike thing you can ride up the road on a 200 pound bike that gives you more pleasure than a 10 grand bike can't you you really can and if it all changed tomorrow and i had to sell the fat boy and i had to sell the triumph and so on and we had to get rid of everything and, and pair right down if another recession god forbid came along then it wouldn't be any hardship for me to go and build a banger out of some old parts and weld it all together and paint it matte black and go and enjoy it because to me the ownership of a pretty bauble is not important but the riding up the road in the sunshine with your mm. knees in the breeze enjoying the spiritual side of riding a motorcycle and feeling good about it that's more important but that doesn't cost any money does it not in real terms you know you don't have to go up the road on a 50cc scooter but there are cheap bikes out there believe mm. me and if your situation as you said if your situation is such that you've got an opportunity to buy a place, go there, my friend, because you may not get that chance again, but there'll always be another bike, won't there? I yeah. hope that's sound advice. Does I hope sound it's sound advice. Like, well, I think it is. Because you've got to look at the long-term future. There's yeah. always going to be a bike that you can have. Yeah, well, I'm old now, so what, 30 <laughs> years on the road, 70-odd motorcycles, there's always another bike, believe me. It might not seem like it today, but there'll always be another bike. 
even if it's not 10 years time, you'll be able to buy another bike one day, but you might not get the chance to buy another place. That's it, hope that more. helps. Hope that helps you. Good luck, my friend, good luck. All right, next question, James Gross. Within the garage, what's the best one or two cheap tools that have test lasted the test of time and surprised you when you look back? Cheap tools. Just the, tools. the trouble is, all tools wear. All tools wear. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got some old tools from your granddad's garage. I think so. Yeah. I don't know about cheap tools, really. Um, cheap tools in terms of poor quality are actually a liability. Um, but by the same token, there's a balance. You don't have to go and buy snap on because you can't often afford it anyway. Mm. Um, but for me, I think it's things like stuff I've been handed, like the pliers that from, from my grandfather and stuff, their sentimental value. Mm. Uh, but I don't know really, I think... But you know, then you, you do need to keep buying new tools to, to yeah. make sure you don't mince a screw or something. She knows, she, knows. <laughs> she listens. But really. you keep them for sentimental yeah. value, so do, it's yeah. a difficult one. That's it, an old worn out tool will cause damage to what it's meant to touch, like fasteners, bolt heads, screws, whatever. Mm. And in that sense, keeping them too long, uh, I don't know. I think sometimes spending a little bit more money on a really good tool, mm. it will still wear out. So if you buy a cheap version, and then replace it when it wears out, actually that's probably a better practice, maybe that's good advice. Cool. Don't know. Good question. Uh, next question, Douglas Smith says, you mentioned once uh, a possible trip across the pond, when will this happen, wow. and what kind of plan do you have, if and when you do make it? Right, to America. We'd love to go, you know we've got friends, in the last Q&A series we did, with Mike and Melly from Michigan came over, so you know we've got friends in America, we've got many, many, many friends in America, and there's a good, you know, mm. dozen or more people that we want to come and visit in the US. Yep. We've been talking about this recently, haven't we? Yeah. Um, we've always said it's next year for about the last three years, mm. but the channel here keeps us nailed down. So my, my job keeps me. Your job, you're self, Penny's self-employed in her own jewelry business, and that, well, you're self-employed. At this employed. moment, I can't just do it. Anybody, anybody self-employed. Mm. When you're self-employed, mm. you can't just shut things down and go away. But if we did, We've been thinking that the right way to go, rather than try and come to the States and visit one or two people, that then excludes others, that would be a shame. We'd like to meet as many people as we can, but then there's a difficulty of sign. America's big. <laughs> you know, if you think, you know, America is big. And of course, the people that we know are as far flung across America and Canada. We've got people we know in Alaska, mm -hmm. Canada, California, Kodiak, Kodiak Island. Island. Pico Island. Pico Island somewhere. in the middle look of... Look that up. <laughs> yeah, look up Pico Island, P-E-C-O. We've got people we know all over the world and to visit one means you don't visit the other. So we did have this, just there's a theory that might work, that we might visit Sturgis, which is the big week-long biker event. It means we get to see a million bikes, we get to meet a million people and have a great time and all the people that we know in the States might be able to come. So mm. giving enough notice, Sturgis, not probably Daytona because it's California. We want to be able to ride a bit as well. I think Sturgis is the one that goes around Mount Rushmore and that. I think mm. there's some nice rides. I rent a bike, do some rides. So I don't know. There's a loose plan to probably make it one of the big bike meets, one of the big annual bike events and go there. Time-wise, probably looking at about three years' time. Oh, God, don't even put a date on it. Should, know. Because things change, don't they? Yeah. At any moment, something can change like it did. This place came up in, mm. a, what, two weeks, wasn't it? All of a sudden, two weeks, boom, we found this place. Yep. We went through the system, bang, we got it three months later. So you don't know, but that's the loose plan, is to try and get to the US, to one of the big events, and then perhaps take it from there where everybody can come to one place and we can have a bit of a meet there, which would be better, and then go for a nice little ride with everyone. Go. Amazing, wouldn't it? Rather than trying to visit, because we've got eight or, t eight or nine states. Yeah, that's right. Trying to do that would take Spending months. Spending all your time travelling. We'd spend months yeah. travelling, tens of thousands of miles, and it would just be so impossible because America's okay. so big. If we do ever get there, we'll if be we sure do. to send. Oh, dear. It'll be, yeah, we'll make it pretty public. We'll make sure we get there in plenty of time, and everybody will know, and we'll make it happen. Big old event. Right. Next. Three more questions. Three there more. were a few more, but we're just going to save them for next time. We are, definitely. Uh, Metal Mickey. Cool. Hi, Metal Mickey. He says, um, his ZX9R needs a new radiator. A genuine one is silly money. You bought the Chinese one for your 750. I need to know, is it worth the risk? Because I don't want a massive drop in risk. quality. Risk? Well, there isn't the any risk. Them, it's not that much What's the risk? risk? I mean, I bought the Chinese radiator for the project here. Um, you know, we've been berated several times for knocking Chinese goods. And we're starting to say, actually, we are wrong to knock Chinese goods, because not all Chinese goods are rubbish. I've checked out the radiator that came from China and I've checked it out against the Kawasaki radiator, the original one. 
which isn't leaking. The only reason we changed it was because the front of the matrix is all buggered up and mm. battered to death. It just looks horrible for a nicely finished project. So really we changed that radiator for more aesthetic. So in my situation, I can keep the old one. I don't see there's any risk because if it fails, you're going to get coolant everywhere. So the only risk is you might get a bit of coolant on the ground and you might have to buy another one. But they do come with a guarantee. We've got a 12-month warranty on that, didn't we? And I think that's pretty good. It's a 12 you're selective guarantee. about where you buy it from. Yeah, yeah. Then buy it from a good source. Yeah. There are good ones. The other side of it is that many parts on today's Harley-Davidson's are made in China and a great many parts on today's Japanese superbikes are made in China. Don't believe they're not. Oh my word. You could, you're fooling yourself if you think they're not. China is the manufacturing sh you know, base for the planet now. We have to just live with that. So I would say go for it. I really would. I, I have no qualms about that radiator at all. That bike got up to working temperature for 40 minutes in a recent video. I let the fan kick in and out four times. It's running the Evans waterless coolant, which runs a little hotter than the water and it's no problem at all. Absolutely no issues at all. There's no leaks, no nothing. The weld quality, when you look closely at it, you know, I look at things like that. I tend to examine things closely. I'm looking for the welds. I'm looking for the way it's finished. There is no difference between that one and the one that I got that was originally on the Kawasaki. Mm. Do you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if that old Kawasaki one, which is thrown under the bench, wasn't made in the same factory mm. 15 Probably. years ago as this one on this bike. I really wouldn't. But also pay through PayPal and then you get the protection yeah. of PayPal. Yeah, if you're worried about your really money, unsure. she said it, absolutely right. If you pay through PayPal, it turns out it's a piece of junk, just take your money back, yep. throw it back up, no problem at all. Hope that helps, I think. Yeah, roll the dice, mate, have some confidence. All right. uh, next question, Andrew Mumby. What is the best thing you have done or has happened to you on or because of motorbikes? All right, cool question. Well, the channel, really. The channel is one of them. All the people we've met. And you, I met you, didn't I? Because of motorbikes? Well, <laughs> not, not because of bikes, but we both have an interest in bikes, we, don't we? We do. We both Actually, share that, that leads me on to the next question. Jonathan Lambert said, um, Penny, did Dale get you into riding, or were you already riding when you met? Well, I was very, very, very young when we very met. Very young, yeah. So yeah. I couldn't have ridden a motorbike. No, too young to ride a bike yeah. at the time, but it was an interest, wasn't it? Yeah. I think the best thing that's happened because of motorbikes, well, friends really, I think if you are a biker, I hate doing rabbit ears, but if you are bracketed a biker, if you're into the lifestyle, if you live the lifestyle of a biker and your mindset, I haven't got a car, she's got a vehicle, she's got a car because she has a business, but I don't have a car, I only have two bikes to ride, and in that sense, I'm happy with the person I am. I think that in the whole answer to that question is that bikes have made me the person that I am and not just the physicality of the machine itself, but the lifestyle around it, the people within it, the brotherhood of people within it. I like the concept when I'm on the road, when I'm on my bike, I see all the cars with their windows wound up and their stress and their veins bulging. And I just think, you know, I'm not with everyone here. You know, that, that fantastic line from Pitch Playing there, I'm not with everybody here. And that's how I look at it. I think bikes have given Certainly me, I can't speak especially for you, but certainly for me, bikes have given me a mindset, a mentality, and a, and a, and a view of the world that I would not have had had I not been into bikes. Because I think there's a whole much more, you can talk for hours on it, about bikes, not just the physical machine, but actually the mentality of it, the fact that you're 1% of road users, you're a minority group, a closely bonded family of people. We nod at each other on the road, most of us, you know and all that and I think that in its own right proves we're a brotherhood we're a brethren we're a family and I would not not have that mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to have a life where all I'd ever done is drive a car and the very great proof of that mm -hmm. is so many guys have a bike when they're young they get into it they experience the lifestyle they experience the brotherhood the family all the rest of it then they get married then they get a car then they just get behind them and then they get bills and then they can't afford it and they get the 45 years of age and they go and take their test and they come back to it they become a, re a returning biker goes to prove that it never left them. We're like the Borg, aren't we? Bikers mm -hmm. are like the Borg. Once you're in, you're in forever. You're assimilated and that's it, the well, mentality. I mean, I used to ride on the back, pillion. Yeah. And then, really nicely, I got my test as a birthday present. Yeah, cool. And I took my test and that's it, really. Definitely. I sometimes go on the back of the bike, but I don't really like it. I rather ride. Do I ride your own bike? Yeah. yeah. I think once you've yeah. ridden a bike, then that's that's your in for women it gives them a kind of empowerment 
Many years ago, the women used to ride the Harleys many, many years ago, in the oh, 20s yeah. and 30s. They were very empowered, and something happened between then and perhaps the last 10 years for some reason. Now, all of a sudden, we've got women riding again. Yeah, yeah the last 10 years has been fantastic yeah. to see women back on bikes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and older rest. women as well. I see so yeah. many older women in their 60s and 70s riding a bike. It's yeah. fantastic. It is good to see. And I think, obviously, motorcycles themselves have changed. They've become easier to ride. If you go back mm -hmm. to the 70s, Mm -hmm. There were most bikes were big, heavy controls. They were big, cumbersome, heavy bikes. They weren't easy to ride, and the little wind. You couldn't even pull the clutch. No, in. no, no. Do you remember we had a Honda Benley, didn't we? We, yeah. picked, we picked up a CD two hundred Honda Benley for you, didn't we? Just to do up for a little play around. Bike. I couldn't even pull the clutch. The in. clutch cable was so stiff, so we put a new cable on it, and it was still just as stiff because the mechanism was all bowed. Honestly, these you know, bikes now today, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah modern just... motorcycles now make it possible that women don't find any hardship difficulty at all and they certainly are coming over in droves mm -hmm. so I, I think you know the future's bright that's how I would look at it and I'm, I'm so happy to be a biker that's my life and if I had it all over again I wouldn't do a thing different in that sense not a single thing love it and long may it continue what 51 halfway I want to be a hundred and still riding and still breaking the law oh yes <laughs> definitely I want to do a wheelie on my hundredth birthday <laughs> it might be my last birthday but it'll be a wheelie <laughs> Right, is there any more? That's it. That is it. Oh my goodness, we've done them all. Well, those questions were from our patrons. We posed them to the patrons because we wanted to make it reasonable quality and we only need about 25. So we'll do a wider Q&A when the new season comes. And if we missed your question, we, we, it's not because we didn't want to answer it. Absolutely. We just ran out of time. So we'll keep them for the next one. Yeah, definitely. And um, hopefully we'll have Mr. Dyson over. Definitely. It's fantastic. Okay, thank you so much for all of your support. Merry Christmas. Happy, Happy New prosperous Year. and peaceful New Year to all of you. Thanks for watching. The next one we're going to do is going to be the much promised simple skills that I was going to do uh, on today, but we didn't get a chance today to do We said, okay, yep. here we are. Anything else, Ben? No, have another one. Have another one. I'll have another one in a minute. I'd like some of them. Take it easy, ride safe. Anything else? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye, all. Take care.